to get us into uh, our topic today. I am so excited about our, our guest and uh, how we're going to be approaching our subject today. But when we think of ourselves we, as artists in the world, we've been trained. We have certain um, elements that have been brought into our education as artists that are essentially the uh, tent poles of, of understanding what we're going to need in, in terms of tools for our journey as artists. The uh, understanding of light and shading and color and blending and perspective and line and form, um, motion, movement. These are all basic, very basic elemental principles of who we are as artists and, and the area of art that we choose to pursue. Um, adopted ruler method of application in action. So these principles are, are core to, to any discipline. They are the guiding force behind what we do and help us to sort of map out where we want to go as creative artists. And soon our tool palette can expand uh, and we bring in an element of technology, whether it is the brushes we work with, the um, movements and uh, form as dancers, or if it is the notes and the instrument that we work with as musicians. Um, but it is a process. There's a scientific, I like the description here of branch of knowledge that deals with the creation and use of technical means and their interrelation with life, society, and the environment. Um, so as we think about technology, um, we can go back to the origins of how it's been in lives today. Um, a few of you may have had these in the past, uh, but this technology has expanded. And when we think about technology in the arts, it, it might, there was a time it might have been perceived as a messy uh, endeavor, but uh, we persevere as artists and we find ways to make these worlds blend, uh, to understand the technology and how we can apply this to our art form. And soon the technology itself evolves and we can uh, make it even more intuitive to what is uh, happening within our minds and within our ideas and our ability to work with these tools and blend them into creating the ideas that we want. Now we take this for granted today, but um, it is a very recent journey that we've been blending these worlds of technology and artistry. And our guest today knows quite a bit about that. He was at the forefront of this and continues to be so. Uh, beginning uh, in the early days of uh, work at the Walt Disney Studios uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, working on such great films as Fox and the Hound, Tron, uh, pioneering the advent and blend of technology and artistry in his Academy Award nominated short, Technological Threat, and his landmark feature film, animated film, Fern Gully. Now, many of you have known that, but you may not know of his work in so many other areas behind the scenes uh, in title sequences and uh, commercials and in feature length live action and animated films. He has also advanced uh, uh, work in many of the forefront of integrating animated techniques and visual effects into live action films and an author with several books. Uh, Bill and his wife Sue have been longtime members of the Academy and served on the Board of Governors for the Motion Picture Academy and are recipients of the Annie Award for their monumental work and accomplishments and achievements for the animation industry. And uh, today, uh, both are educators. Uh, Bill teaches at Chapman University at the Dodge College for Film and Media Arts and is now responsible for cultivating our next generation of pioneering filmmakers and animators. 
and it is a great pleasure to be able to spend some time with this pioneer trailblazing artist, animator, director, story artist, educator, um, groundbreaking uh, trailblazer within industry, Bill Cryer. So Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Let me get you here on camera. <laughs> And it's great to have you here. Thanks for, for joining in today. Pleasure to be here. Good research on all those posters there. I haven't seen some of those in years. Good. Uh, <laughs> Just sort of bringing us up to date, a little, little journey back. Now, you um, got your start at the Disney Studios uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Is that correct? 1977. I actually got my start right out of Northwestern University when I uh, had to do a, I had to do a cart, I had to do a film for an advertising class. I was in the Medill School of Journalism. And I just thought, what the heck, I like to draw. I wasn't an art major, but I like to draw. I thought, I'll do one of those animated films. So I got, I went and bought the Preston Blair book, the one that everybody in our generation started with. And I saw, oh, animation, you do a drawing, you change it, you do a drawing. So I did this little animated film of a little snake with a little hat turning around and winking and I shot it on a Super 8 camera. And when it came back from the drugstore, you know, the developed film and I put it on the projector and I ran that and that little guy stood up and turned around and winked at me. My life changed at that moment. That was it. I thought I've just given life. I've created life and that was it. And from that, that, that literally that moment, I've never really worked at anything else but animation, you know. I had 50 odd jobs before that moment, but that was the day. That was really the change in my life. I just loved animation. I just fell in love with animation. Unfortunately, there was no one in Chicago to learn from. So I taught myself how to animate, and I actually did a, an educational film for my food co-op. I was in a food co-op, and we used to go out to churches and inner city groups, and we used to explain what a buying club was. So I did an animated educational film on what a buying club was, you know? And a college in Chicago saw that film and said, where did you guys get this? And they said, this guy up in Northwestern did it. And they tracked me down and they said, we want to hire you to make educational films. So I became a professional filmmaker, you know, and I, for three years I made animated educational films in Chicago. And then Chuck Jones came to Chicago and I hauled my projector into his hotel room and I said, I'm an animator. <laughs> And you know how sweet Chuck was. You know, Chuck was the sweetest guy in the world. And he actually watched the film. And he looked at it. And he said, you did this untrained? And I said, yeah. He says, you know, I think you should go to Hollywood. You could make it. And based on that, you know, if Chuck Jones tell you you can make it. That's a golden boy. I, I told my mom, I got to move to Hollywood now. So I came out to Hollywood in 1975. And the only person I knew was Chuck Jones. And I said, I went to his office. I said, here I am remember me? And he goes, yeah, good luck. <laughs> said, good luck. Are you going to hire me? And he goes, no, nah, I'm not hiring anybody. But anyway, I mean, I went right to Disney, but they wouldn't hire me because I had no art school, never took an art class, had no life drawing, had no portfolio. I just had these stupid educational films. So I got a job. Luckily for me, you know, life is so full of luck. You don't realize uh, life is full, but but I did go to tw I did interview with every single studio in LA. I went to like all nineteen functioning animation studios in nineteen seventy five. Mm -hmm. You know there was you know, think there's filmation and there was H and B and there was Murakami Wolf. Remember? Yeah. I went to every one of them and got turned down at every one of them. And then Spun Buggy said, "We'll hire you. How little will you work for?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, I'll work for anything." So they hired me for four dollars an hour to in between, and I went to work for them. And guess who the animation director was? Frank Terry. Oh my gosh! Really? Who would go on to be the head guy at CalArts? So I literally, for two years, I went from being an in betweener to a full animator in one year. And then the second year, I was animating Hulk commercials, and that's the reel I took to Disney after two years. So I was basically paid to train to be an animator. I trained at Spun Buggy. And I went to Disney with my reel and they looked at it. And uh, I was told later in the review meeting, they said, well, this guy has no art school. He has no portfolio. But one voice spoke up and said, but look at the reel, the guy can animate. And the voice was Don Bluth. 
Ah. So Don Bluth basically talked me into Disney. And wow. I went in and I got it. And it was one of those uh, Malcolm Gladwell things about, you know, you're at the right place at the right time. I walk in the same week as John Musker and Brad Bird and Henry Selleck and, you know, John Lasseter. Everybody's there because it's their starting the new generation thing. Yeah. And they all came from schools, but I came from the industry. And, um, and that was how I got into the, well, that's how I got my shot. You know, as you know, in those days, to get into the Disney training program, they gave you two four-week tests. And they set you at a desk with a stack of animation paper. And they say, animate something, you get four weeks, and we'll shoot a pencil test. And after the first four weeks, we'll look at it. And if it's good enough, you can do the second four weeks. And if it's not good enough, you're out. So I did the first four weeks and I got through. And so for the second four weeks, I thought, okay, I'm really going to show these guys. I'm going to make an entire movie in four weeks. And I did. I made, and it was funny because John Musker did like one test of a fat woman, you know, and I think, I forget what Brad did. Brad did a pretty, we were all sitting in the same room together doing these tests. But I made an entire, and I, I have that movie to show you. Yeah, let's take a look at it. It's kind of, it's you know, it's kind of, it's look, it has no sound. That's all. It's kind of fun to watch. And uh, this is the movie that got me the job at Disney. So I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, I'll show you guys this movie. And it's cleverly called Bill Croyer presents another test. This is a bad transfer off of a. Here we go. Now, this would be late 70s, right? 70s. 1977. This is summer of 77. And, you know, we would we would animate a scene and we'd take the real, every, every morning, the scene would come back on film and we would go into Eric Larson's office. And Eric Larson, one of the nine men, was our t teacher. And he would basically look at the scene and make comments. And, you know, that's like having Leonardo da Vinci give you comments. And yeah. I, I was so stunned. Eric would look at the scenes you're looking at right here and he would say, take out one frame or add one frame or push this pose a little bit. And every time I would do that adjustment, it, it, it was like a hundred percent difference in the quality of the, of the scene, you know, but this is the day when we were, you know, what they really valued, it was full animation. You know, it's very unlike today where a lot of films are posed, you know, and very graphic and simple, but, Disney at the time, as you can see, they valued the ability to move volumes, the ability to strap, squash, and stretch. But mostly, it's always been, they wanted to get a sense of a living character, you know? Mm -hmm. Did you kind of feel that this little guy was alive, you know, this little clock guy? And did you get what he was doing? So anyway. So clearly, um, you were able to continue your next four weeks, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, they were, kind of impressed with this and I, I you know I, I don't rub it in on my own students but I said look if I can do this in a month why can't you do this in a semester you know it's, it's <laughs> good object lesson but you know but this is the thing is that you know what the difference between um between what I was doing then oh these are some of my pencil tests on Fox and Hound here so that's what I went on to is um Fox and Hound actually I am between a Pete's Dragon first mm -hmm. These are all in the movie, you know, all these shots. Yeah. And I was, um, I did practically the whole, the whole chase sequence of the little fox and the dog and everything. And at a pivotal time for animation, uh, you know, there was this thought that animation would shut down at that point. Disney was the biggest house in, in town, and, and with Walt gone by the late mid 60s, uh, Ken Anderson. Did you work with Ken Anderson? And I did. He was there. Ken was still there. You know, Frank and Ollie had just stopped working and were working on their book. You know, we used to do their galleys. And in fact, my wife Sue, of course, was the person that Frank identified as being the person he was writing the book for. He said to Sue, you're exactly, you're a young person really interested in it, you know. And he used to have Sue read the galleys and give comments on it. And of course, you know, Wooly was still there. Wolf and Rather was there. Mark Davis. We were so lucky to have those legendary guys in the building. Yeah. And in those days, you know, it was those, those years, of those Disney training years in the 70s were like a dream because there was no um, deadline for production. There was no release date. There was none of that pressure. You know, we worked on scenes as long as it was necessary to get them perfect. You could walk into anybody's office and ask for advice. And 
and they'd ask you to sit down and chat and you'd have a chance to talk to the greatest people that ever worked. And the archive was accessible to us. So we would get the drafts of the feature films, Snow White, Pinocchio, Lady and the Tramp, and we would just go through the draft and we would say, I want this scene, this scene, and this scene. And an hour later, a girl would come up with a dolly with stacks of the original animation drawings in their folders. And we would sit at our desk and flip the scenes from Dumbo and Pinocchio, and we put them on our pegs and roll them. The actual artwork nowadays, good luck. Yeah. Getting yeah. your hands on one piece of animation with white gloves in the Disney archive, you can't even get in there. But that was bizarre, wasn't it? I mean, the fact that we had access to that. So it was like having, it was like having access to the library at you know Alexandria or something. It was like a <laughs> really rare time. And it's textbook. My gosh, living and on paper. My gosh. Now you were also part of the uh, was it the Rats Nest, the the legendary group. Yes, of the legendary Rats Nest. It was, you know, what happened basically was that as they looked for a successor, they kind of looked to Don Bluth, you know, because Don was the elder guy. But Don got into this whole thing about rotoscoping. He really wanted to rotoscope directly shots. You know, Disney had always used live action reference since the beginning, it's very well known, but they never rotoscoped. They used it as, they viewed it as motion reference and then they actually animated. Don wanted us to trace the live action. Wow. And <clears throat> we were, you know, me and Mosker and Brad, you know, and Henry, so we were all very much against that. We felt we're animators, we should be animating. That's the whole art form that we were kind of devoted to. And uh, and I did this thing that was kind of the instigation of the whole thing. I went up, I was the first animator to actually request a meeting with Ron Miller, the head of the studio. No animator ever went up to the third floor and I went up there and he said, what do you want? And I said, not sure you understand what's kind of going on downstairs. I said, we're having this kind of tug of war about animation. And he said, what do you mean? And so I, I, we, me and, and Musker and Selleck and Bert, we set up a little screening for him to look at some animation. And Don heard about that and he was furious. And he charged into our room and he said, you guys are just a bunch of rats and this is a rat's nest of, um, and we accepted that name proudly, you know, and, uh, Shortly after that, Don left and took all the guys, his crew with him, you know. And uh, they went on to be, of course, very successful and, you know, and do a lot of films and everything. It was just a, it was just a matter of, uh, of taste between the two groups. And ironically, almost everybody that was in that group ended up leaving Disney, any, our group, because, you know, Brad got fired and John Lasseter got fired and Henry left and I left. So it was because the atmosphere kind of just changed at Disney then, you know, it went into the whole black cauldron direction. And a lot of people weren't crazy about that. So anyway, that was kind of the story of the, <laughs> in, in the most brief sense, the story of the rat's nest. So you would, even though, despite having formal training, you got quite a bit of incredible training while during your time at Disney in classic traditional animation, 2D animation. Let's talk a little bit about how you made this transition into to technology. What, what was your first um, introduction to the computer and to the digital age? Well, it was Tron, you know, it was absolutely Tron. I mean, it, it, uh, nobody was doing anything like that in character animation. And, you know, I left Disney after my first period at Disney training and then going into, you know, the animation on, on Small One and Fox and Hound and everything. Uh, Steve Lisberger came to town and he said, I have this film, I'm doing Animal Olympics, I'd like, I need animators. And that was when Black Cauldron was the next assignment. And I just thought, wow, Animal Olympics sounds like more fun. And so I left and Steve made me animation director of Animal Olympics. And as you know, that movie became kind of legendary because we had a pretty good crew. You know, Brad Bird left Disney and he came on Animal Olympics. Roger Allers, it's gonna be the Lion King, it was on Animal Olympics. So we had this kind of stellar crew and we had a blast. And the movie we were developing as our follow-up to Animal Olympics was Tron. Steve Lisberger had this idea about doing a movie about a guy who's a video gamer who gets sucked into a computer. And so as animation director of the studio, I was, you know, and, and, the, and the most experienced storyboard guy, I started boarding all of the ideas, storyboarding all the ideas for Tron. And originally, you know, it was going to be a, uh, a hand-animated film done with backlit glowing lines. Mm-hmm. But then um, this funny thing happened, you know, 
it was like holding, we always, Steve used to say it was holding, a, it was like holding a bug light up on a porch on a, on a summer night. It attracted yeah. every person in the United States interested in computer graphics started calling the studio and saying, you're doing a computer animated film. We want to help you out. One of whom, of course, was Alan Kay, who invented the laptop. And we started to get all this input and Steve started thinking, you know what, I think the industry might be able to actually do this film in a computer. Yeah. And what an irony that he sold the movie back to Disney. <laughs> it was the last place we expected to end up was Disney. But of course, Tom Wilhite was this young executive who had just come aboard. He wanted to make a difference. And he saw this as a visionary project. So all of a sudden I find myself going back to Disney and Steve said, well, you know, Bill's my animation director and Disney said, well, he can't do that. He's only been an animator for a few years. <laughs> and Steve said, well, I'm sorry, but he's my guy. So bless his heart. He brought me back there and I, that was my role. So I, so Jerry Reese and I basically storyboarded all of, all of Tron. And then, uh, you know, we acted as the animation animators, animation supervisors. We made up a title call computer image choreographer because nobody had ever animated by computer before. You know, you have to realize in 1980, there was software to model objects, to light objects, to render objects, but nobody had written any software to move objects. There was no animation software. So to make Tron, we had to literally define where we would render something 24 times for one second. I, I do have some Tron stuff there. Would you like to see? Uh, to see that. Is this a little bit of that? kind of the bleeding edge of, of where we stepped off to the, the threshold to where we are today. Um, and yeah, this is, it's, it's kind of interesting. This is this stuff. It was so nutty how we did this film, you know, um, you know, of course we started with great things. We had the Mobius design, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And then, um, what are we doing? and then we translated that into solid geometry models because there was no real vector there were only a few companies that could model in vectors. So this, these were the Magi Synth Division geometry bikes. Wow. And there was no such thing as motion software. So we had to render each bike in place in every frame. So we came up with this method of defining by numbers how the model would do. This is my diagram of wow. explaining how we would define the bike's yaw, pitch, and roll. And then uh, we literally had to diagram all the motion. So we got graph paper. And we, as you can see, the path of the bike, we would draw that, we would indicate, and we had to, you know, we would indicate when it would turn and what the angles would be. And we had to define how the camera would move. So these are the, if you can believe this, these are the handmade diagrams. And then from those diagrams, Jerry and I would figure out the coordinates. And here you see an X sheet of a couple of seconds of, of bike motion. And you can see, you know, the yaw pitch vertical roll and everything on it. I had to write down the handwritten values for every single frame. Wow. 145 values for one second. So Tron, which had 50 minutes computer animation, had 900 seconds of footage, which meant that we had 322,000 <laughs> hand recorded values. What an insane person would make this movie. And then some poor, this poor guy at the computer company would have to take what we wrote down and enter it. And that guy is Chris Wedge. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we filmed it on a film recorder. And the first time we ever saw a test then was in 70 millimeter. Wow. We never saw it. There was no way to play a test on a computer screen. But this was the storyboard. And so that's why we storyboarded so precisely, because we really had to have in our mind exactly what we were going to do, you know. Anyway, I won't get to, you've seen this. Incredible. Um, um, how many, was it just a small handful of, of artists on this, right? Well, you're looking at the entire animation crew right there. There, yeah, that's it. I always, I always call that a kind of ironic picture because we're working at, we got a computer like the last four months in order to help preview. But the object in the background, a lot of students today cannot tell you what that is. That's a moviola. That's the thing that you would reel up the 35 millimeter film on and watch. And yeah. that's how we learned. And now that those days are gone. Um, so anyway, as you know, things went on from there. So, so you really transitioned. Um, so 
How much convincing did it take? I mean, you really, as you said, it took a while to even get the equipment that you needed. Were you uh, working with, and, and there wasn't software out there, you had to kind of develop things. Ultimately, did did other uh, companies come on board? The studio came on board with, wait a minute, there's something happening here, let's support this? Was well, it famously, no, you know, I mean, when we finished Tron, you know, as you know, John Lasseter, who used to sit with us all the time and watch us work, became the most excited about, you know, uh, computer animation. And and he, famously, when he, he finally got them to do the Where the Wild Things, well, Where the Wild Things are test, and when it was finished, they said, well, we're not going to go in this direction, John. Thank you very much. We don't need you anymore. And they fired John Lasseter. Yeah. Billion dollar mistake. And then I left and everybody left because Disney gave up on computer animation. So. I went, I went in, I was so excited about it though, that I ended up working for the companies that made Tron. You know, Magi opened a studio in LA and I worked for them and then afterward, Digital Productions um, opened up, you know, down in, um, in the marina. And I started to, uh, you know, work with them. And that was just so much fun, you know, because it was um, a company that was, you know, trying to do something new. They were trying to use the computer to make animation. Again, there was no real motion software, you know, because you were using objects, but then digital productions uh, finally wrote software for hierarchical motion. And that was motion that uh, meant that you could build an, a, a body with joints and hinges and move it. And so uh, I did this test using, um, you know, a wireframe character and I think it's one of the very first examples of character animation, at least human figure animation ever done in a computer. And I had that right here. Well, let's take a look. Let me, let me show that to you. So this was called Block Woman. <laughs> and uh, and those all that, those are tape splices, the lines. Wow. So again, this was pretty darn revolutionary. This is around 1983. And people would come through the studio and absolutely be blown away. Like, how in the world did you guys ever do this? I mean, it's not, obviously not very inspired. There's no story here, but as far as making a character move, this is pretty revolutionary stuff. Wow. The man. You can hear the soundtrack, it's a Mick Jagger song. <laughs> so the thing about this is they sent this to Mick Jagger. Really? And they said, hey, look what we did with your song. And the result was Mick Jagger called back and said, I want you to do my next video. <laughs> and so that was how we ended up with, uh, here, I'll, well, you've probably seen it enough of this. So. That's great. So and then we ended up doing uh, Hard <laughs> Woman. And we kept, you know, we couldn't do skin in those days, right? Yeah. So we decided to make a woman out of vectors. And that was this movie. Have you ever seen this, Hard Woman? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we did this human figure motion of Hard Woman. And, um, you know, I just jump forward. You know, it's just like, uh, it's all this, uh, there's Mick Jagger. And this is the very first, I think, computer on-screen kiss. <laughs> I believe that's the first script kiss ever done in computer animation. And we did actual digital compositing on this, you know? It was actual, um, it wasn't like composited optically. This was all stuff that was scanned into the computer. And Mick Jagger is holding a guitar that has reflective tape on it. So it actually looks like it's a vector guitar, even though he's holding it. Oh my gosh. We did silly, stupid stuff like uh, this scene. Where you, Misses. <laughs> How this long? A, now this scene was really hard to do, to have a live character dance with a computer animated character. And uh, the way it was done, of course, because there was no other way to, uh, to do that. We had these big screens called Evan Sutherland monitors and they were vector monitors they were black with white lines on them and so i had a 35 millimeter projector 
on a tripod behind my chair. And we had already filmed Mick Jagger doing all his dance moves. So we would, I would project Mick Jagger's image onto the monitor. And then I would sit there with all my dials and I would dial this girl into a frame. And then when I got it the way I wanted, I would turn around and I would hit a button. I would advance the frame, one frame of Mick Jagger. Then I'd sit down and I'd dial again. And that was the way I got the girl to dance with Mick Jagger in total insanity, you know. I mean, it was, but you know what? It was so unbelievably addictive. I mean, yeah. we would sit there at our computers for 24 hours at a time, it, all the time. We were so hooked. It was so, nobody had ever done this before. It was so exciting to do it. I can't tell you the numbers of times we would look at our watches and say, hey, McDonald's opens in five minutes at 6 a.m. Who's going to go get the food? You know? <laughs> I mean, literally, we would just work all night. We would not even think about it. And because uh, it was so exciting to be doing something no one had ever done before. You know, it was just, I, we, all, we all had that, we were aware of that. We were aware, we were actually doing something no one's ever done in the history of the world. Nobody's ever done this. And how many times did you get to do that? So that was fun. So, you know, when you reflect on those times and to see where we are today, I mean, it's traveled light years, but in many ways, you know, projecting even forward, where will we be in 20 years with VR and, and other frontiers? But uh, that's what I think is so exciting about your work, that you you were right there at the forefront um, shaping where we are today and generations growing up with the work that you did that we kind of almost take it for granted in a way. Um, I remember when that video came out, and it was landmark. It was a, a mind shift for everybody to go, wow, look at look at this. How was that done? Uh, so every every ounce of your time there was well worth it. <laughs> now you... Well, the, thing that, the thing that made it different was, the, was exactly the thing that continues to be the principle to apply, and that is fundamental principles of motion, entertainment, et cetera, always look great to an audience no matter what technology is used to do them yeah. and when i did that stupid little black woman you know part of the reason that the computer world was amazed by it was that it actually looked like a person moving mm -hmm. and that was pure animation the te technology was primitive beyond belief the prim i'll never forget when uh, one of the visitors came was behind standing behind the monitor looking at my test he said, what software did you use for that? <laughs> and Gary Demos, the owner of the company said, it's just keyframe software, you know? <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, keyframe software in the hands of anyone but a real animator would look like horrible stuff, but you give it to a person who can actually animate. And of course, John Lasseter was really the guy who blew the world open because when he brought basic, fundamentally solid Disney style animation and story into the computer world, that revolutionized the whole business because you had up to that point you had people who were inventing the tools who had no talent using the tools but when you took somebody who had actual animation skill it makes the difference and that applies so perfectly now and, and, virtu and virtual reality is like kind of like the exhibit a for that you know where you see people making really dumb and boring virtual reality projects because they don't have fundamental skills right. you know, and you, you take somebody with fundamental skill they can go into any medium. They can go into clay. They can go into stop motion drinking straws and they can make something that is entertaining and captivates an audience. You know, the Don Hertzfeld stick figures are kind yeah. of the first, you know, you look at Don Hertzfeld films, they're stick figures and the whole audience is roaring with laughter. You know, you put them up against the multi-million dollar CG films that are completely boring and there you have it. So that's really been the driving kind of like principle in my life. It started with Disney with those little pencil tests and learning from Eric Larson and learning fundamental animation and fundamental staging and fundamental story. And every step of the technology growth, the only thing was I just brought that to the party and that was the thing that made the difference, you know. And that shows in your work, you've talked about symbiotic filmmaking and kind of applying those two elements together. Uh, but it, it seems to always, essentially, as you're saying, come back to story, come back to staging, come back to entertainment, and, and needing a balance of that. Um, you applied a lot of that at Rhythm and Hughes. Talk a little bit about your, your time there. 
I'd known, uh, you know, John Hughes and, and Pauline Cho since they started the company, and it had never really occurred to me to work for them. But, uh, you know, after after Fern Gully and after, uh, you know, I, we d I did a brief development period at Warner Brothers, you know, I was free and my agents sent me down to do a commercial at, at Rhythm and Hughes. And at the end of the week, they were having me do four commercials and I just clicked with them. And again, they seemed to be the perfect spot because they were the preeminent technologists in the business, but they were a little bit short on classical fundamental artist training. You know, they really didn't have any kind of like what you call A-list Disney animators at the time. And so there was another place that I just kind of filled in a, a necessary role. You know, I just brought that sensitivity to the projects and it worked out great. You know, I ended up, you know, it was kind of a weird thing. I, they gave me a desk in the corner of this one room and I stayed at that desk for 12 years and never <laughs> moved. And in the process did, I don't know, seven or eight features and, you know, probably a hundred commercials and things. And it was just a wonderful place to be because we just kept developing new tools all the time. <clears throat> you know, in those days, it was before the off-the-shelf software that is the dominant thing today. You know, if, if you want to start a studio today, you can pretty much buy software to do almost anything. But in those days, you know, in the 80s, um, I'm sorry, the 90s, this is the, the, the mid-90s, every studio kind of wrote their own software. And that was part of their value is, oh, Rhythm and Use has fur, you know, this company has water, you know, these guys do this. And so you would kind of go to the company that had the software that would, that would accomplish what you wanted. And Rhythm and Hughes had its own software department and they were constantly writing their own code. And we worked, we had all of our own software. You know, we didn't have Wavefront or Maya, we had Voodoo, you know, and we had these different um, packages that were all custom to Rhythm and Hughes and only Rhythm and Hughes. And that was, you know, that was fun. I mean, we, we had a great time um, just experimenting. It's funny, you know, I, I did this polar bear commercial and it was the very first polar bear commercial ever done with real fur. It was this little bear swimming under the water. And there was a scene in that commercial where the bear had to splash the water to gain the, get the attention of his mom. And they were really stuck because they said, we have no water simulations, you know, and I said, well, why don't we just animate it in 2D? So I, I called up one of my effects animator friends and I said, we'll give you the printouts and why don't you just animate a water splash and then we'll ink and paint it and we'll just comp that into the computer. And that's what we did. And if you look at the commercial, you would never guess that that water splash is not a, a, a simulation. And that was hand animated, sheath framed. So it was one of those things of just being, you know, flexible and open enough to combine whatever you want to make it work you know and there's you know there's no evil in technology you know a lot of people look at motion capture and they say oh it's not animation it's not animation but it's not evil there's nothing evil about motion capture you know motion <laughs> capture is just another tool to use right well and i think and what i love about your your experience and your approach is that it, it is and many of of those john lester and others have always talked about how it is a tool to serve a story and to serve the artistry and, and story first. Um, but you've been at the forefront of the development of so many of these tools, always keeping that principle of story first and foremost. Talk a little bit about Fern Gully. That has such a, a treasured uh, following um, and it's, it's how many, 20 some years now, 26 years? Well, it was 92, right? So it's yeah. 28 years, yeah. Huh. 28 years at this point, yeah. Well, when I left Disney to go in the computer world, you know, I worked at digital productions and stuff, but then I, I, I was frustrated by the limitations of character animation. You saw that block woman, you saw the vector woman. You know, let's face it, that's not Disney style character animation. So I, I really wanted to do something where I could animate characters fully, but also use the power of the computer to do something different. And that was when I came up with that idea to have a computer draw. You know, you could build things in the computer, but then using a plotter technology, it would draw it on animation paper. So all of a sudden, you had computer imagery in the same medium as the drawer, and you can easily draw on it and enhance it and ink and paint it, and you'd get this unusual thing. And that was where Tech Threat came about, of course. 
So I did tech threat and then that became successful. And we got a lot of jobs, you know, out of technological threat. One of which was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the title is a Disney film. And ironically, these guys from Australia who had the Fern Gully idea came to town to try to find an animation company to do F Fern Gully. And uh, the producer of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was married to a writer and they hired that writer to write the Fern Gully script. And he said, well, you should, he said, there's only one small studio in town that does Disney quality <clears throat> that's not Disney and that's Croyer, and which was true. So they came over to our, cause we were all ex Disney guys. And so they came to our studio and in one day, they decided to give us the Fern Gully feature. Wow. And we're going, you realize we have 13 people, right? <clears throat> and they said, it doesn't matter, you can grow, you know? <laughs> and so, how stupid were we? Anyway, so anyway, Sue and I talked about it that night. And we said, well, you know, it's a fairy movie, which is not like our dream movie, but it's probably not going to happen very often. The people are going to walk in our office and offer us a feature. So we, we took the movie and, uh, you know, we were so fortunate because you know, look at the key people we had. We had Ralph Eggleston as our art director, we had Tony Pichilli as our character designer. The guys that went on to become, the, yeah. you know, Pixar's, you know, foundation were working for us. And that was why Fern Gully just had like this kind of blessed thing, you know. And we set out to make the movie. And in two years, we built a studio and made a movie all in two years. And that was kind of the thing and technology was a big part of that because we use that plotter process as you know we did 40,000 plots we did everything we did the inside of trees we did uh, you know the flight paths of all the birds and a batty coda and we did the leveler machine you know we did just all these things in the movie that would have taken thousands of hours of human drawing we did with you know with our little computer department and that was pretty innovative and um, you know it was a like I said it was a pretty magical process for us. Perfect storm of talent, both, as you said, behind the scenes, on the screen. Uh, my gosh, Tim Curry and uh, Robin Williams, Ji Jin Chong, some incredible talent. But then also behind the scenes, top, you know, Kathy Zielinski and, and uh, just some real powerhouse animation. Dan, you know, we just said this, Dan, uh, Dan Jupe. I mean, just so many people that were you know, Steve Markowski and Ken Bruce and, you know, just a ton of people that were just so great. Yeah. You know, do you have any elements from that film that you could share a little bit about or? Yeah, I have. I, let's see, what do I, I, you, I know it's a fan favorite. We have a lot of folks that have grown up with that treasure and uh, it spawned. Uh, yeah, well, I do. I, I unfortunately didn't get these Ready, but I will. Um, hang on a second. Um, well, I mean, I have some of the making of stuff here uh, that's kind of interesting to see. I think. Uh, I think this is great. These are the fun surprise elements we can. Yeah, let me uh, let me share my screen here. Sorry. You know we. It was quite remarkable how, how fast we did this movie. Uh, and we actually went to Australia to do it, you know, which was kind of cool. Um, that was me in the lower right, when the writer Jim Cox and two of the producers from Australia, that was our gang. There you see Ralph Eggleston in the lower right in the black t-shirt. The girl in the red, you recognize her? Oh, Vicki Jensen. Really? Oh my gosh. Yeah, Vicky was one of our painters and she went to Australia with us and she, uh, you know, now she's doing the film with Skydance. We actually went to the rainforest in Australia and everything in the movie is real. You know, those are some of the leeches that would attach themselves to our legs. Yeah. But, you know, things like the fairy rings, you know, these trees that would grow in rings and all little animals, rainforest lobster. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we basically put all this stuff into the movie. You know, as you can see, the fauna was just exact. It was almost like we didn't have to invent it. There's a goanna on the tree with a waterfall nearby, and that ended up in the movie exactly like that. Wow. There's Vicky in the background, and Dennis Venizelos doing some development art. And we went through a lot of different styles trying to find the look for the film, you know, and uh, finally ended up, you know, with 
These are some of Ralph's pastels, of course. Oh, yeah, stunning. That was the final, these are the final production paintings for the film. We had all these experiments with the characters to see if we do different colors with them, et cetera. And Krista at one time was gonna not have any clothes, which is, <laughs> wasn't gonna fly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> these were Tony Pacilli's very first Krista drawings, and they were just tremendous. I mean, if you look at them, yeah, they instantly had so much personality. Yeah, we recognized immediately that this was going to work, you know, for it's her. Mark Davis elements in there; those are great. This was one of the very first uh, cell setups that kind of clued us into making things look miniature. Was having very out of focus backgrounds; it just made everything look miniature. These are the original designs the Australians brought, which were not very conducive to hand-drawn animation. <laughs> wow, yeah. We, we of course, simplified these and made all our model sheets and, um, wow. you know, turnarounds, all the traditional stuff you do in 2D animation, expression sheets, etc. These were Dan Jupe's original sketches for the characters, wow. all the animals. And the Beetle Boys, of course, we ended up, that's one, another example of how the computer worked because we would build the Beatles in the computer and plot them out. Gave us very solid motion keys. Even a character like this was plotted out. Who would want to draw that? <laughs> oh my gosh. And, um, you know, a lot of just great iconic scenes. And, you know, I, I had never heard of a color script before Fern Gully. And Ralph Eggleston, who was such a student of the film and loved William Cameron Menzies, you know, oh. we got to do a color script. And so Ralph did this color script. He did, look, he did hundreds of these gorgeous pastels, but he also did this color script. And you can see every sequence has a different color and tone. And now every film has color strips. Yeah. Every film has a color script. But Ralph, I think, was the first to do it. Fun. These are Ralph's simple pastels that were so genius. You know. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah, his work is, is mesmerizing. Yeah, I mean, he just captured, um, that's a pastel, and that was what came, it ended up in the movie. These are real plants, these, these, these eyeball mushrooms that have little eyes like that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, uh, he influenced it well, and then Hexus, oh my gosh, Kathy's amazing animation there. You know, yeah. and the that that film has had on so many of the things that follow just in terms of look and style and detail and design it's, it's uh, I think a film that needs and deserves a another look you know you're right about that when you watch it and you start thinking about things you've seen in subsequent films it is kind of interesting how a lot of stuff turns up these <laughs> four tons of paint I always love the statistic four tons of cell vinyl paint I can see that. That was our renderer, Korean people. Wow. Yeah, 32,000 pounds of art. Where is the artwork living today? <laughs> Where's the art living? Yeah. The art, unfortunately, this is one of the sad stories of Fern Gully, was the art was, this was sold by the company that financed the movie that owned it. They sold it to an art auction house in oh. Iowa called Gallery Landsberg. And the art has disappeared. No wow. one knows where it is. That the gallery went bankrupt, and uh, I've heard different stories about it. I've heard it's been destroyed and everything. I mean, I, you know, I, I actually, luckily, um, accidentally, a lot of the art fell off the truck. Hmm. <laughs> so there is, I have a reasonable amount of it, but um, I, I admit I haven't been really selling it that much. I don't know what it is. I'm kind of dear to my heart you know I like you know there's something about cell painting yeah. looking at a real cell that yeah. I remember when we'd go into the ink and paint department and all the painters would be polishing the cells and fixing them with all this loving care and I just thought this loving care has got to show up and you got to feel it on the screen you know you have to feel it and uh I don't know it's just something there was something really we lost something when we went digital I know it's it's easier to produce and everything but man I tell you cell art yeah, there's nothing quite like it. But are we getting close to it with technology? I mean, is let's let's shift a little bit and talk about where technology is taking us today. Um, you really have seen such a progression. Um, in terms of storytelling, how is technology serving story? Well, I always say you have to be careful of the seduction of technology. And that is where you allow 
the, your mystification with it to give the illusion that you're supplying something you're not, you know, I mean, it's still, you know, look, there are times when you can do imagery that is so fascinating and captivating that in itself, it becomes almost the end that, you know, it's the result, you know, there, there's definitely something to that, but beautiful imagery that's actually serving an idea is by far more effective, you know, and so having an underlying message to the audience an underlying story that you're trying to tell them is always going to be far more effective. And that's the thing we constantly tell things because as technology becomes not only more powerful, but almost more accessible by more people, you know, almost anyone can download software on their computer. You can go to a tutorial site and in a few, you know, in a couple of days, you're making computer anima computer animation, supposedly. And everybody thinks that's it. You know, the fact that you can make it is it. And the sad fact is that, no, it's really not. It's, what are you trying, is there, is there a message underneath? Is there an idea? Is there an emotion that you're trying to convey? That's really the important thing about it. You know, that's the thing that sets you off. And so that's the thing we try to teach students is don't be seduced by technology. You know, have something to say. And, uh, you know, become a full person. Don't just become a technologist. You know, if you look at those old Don Graham books about what a Disney animator should know, mm. you know, them that, you know, well, you got to know music and you got to know ballet. And you got to go to the theater and you got to know geology. and You got to know history. And, you, and they run down all that. You got to read literature, you know, because that's where you get at original ideas and you have something to say. And then you say it with technology. But if you don't have that first thing, something to say, it, you just kind of get, it just becomes kind of pictures, you know. Mm -hmm you lose the humanity to it. Um, I want to open it up to questions. Um, Matt, if we've got a few questions coming in, let's get folks aligned here who have some. Uh... Yeah, you, you mentioned technology and technology moving forward. Uh, what do you think about VR animation? And do you think that's a viable tool for animation and filmmaking? Um, yeah, VR is, yeah, absolutely. It's a new, it's a really fun new thing. Uh, I kind of think it's being misused and misunderstood. You know, I, I don't think you can bring traditional filmmaking, uh, storytelling technique into VR because look, the essence of traditional filmmaking is staging and cutting, right? Where am I precisely looking? What's in the frame composition and when do I cut away to something else? VR removes all of that from you. You don't have that because People can look anywhere they want. And that's, so what happened, what you had next was you had people trying to mimic traditional filmmaking by having noises go off or having, you know, light over here. Um, nobody's really cracked the code yet on what I think will be effective VR storytelling technique. You know, VR is the perfect technique for immersion and discovery. You know, you're in there, you can look anywhere and that's the whole value of it. So I think that, uh, that's that's the frontier that people have to start exploiting. You have to exploit the strengths of VR. You don't want to start, make it mimic something that it's, it, the whole invention of VR is not to be, you know, traditional staging and cutting. So you got to start getting your head around a different kind of storytelling, right? And how you can make it work. But, you know, and the other thing that's blocking VR, of course, is the imagery is so crummy because just when we get into 4K high dynamic range monitors, we're supposed to go back to these crummy little glasses, you know, and that's, that's really irritating to a lot of us. Uh, I think that's going to be a big breakthrough when they finally come up with a way to get high resolution imagery. Then you're really going to see it take off. You know, then it's going to be like ready player one, right? Where you, you can't tell that you're not in the, in the world. So uh, I think those are the two things. The technological thing will be improving the imagery itself. And then mentally the storytelling thing will be finding a way to create stories, and tell stories that exploit the very nature of what VR offers, and that is freedom of movement. Answer, answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, Matt. What else do we have? Well, we've seen a lot of changes to animation in the past few years, even the, just the past few months. Uh, how do you think animation is going to look like in the next five years? Um, you know, you know, I don't really see any fundamental breakthrough because we've now gotten to the point, and we all knew it was coming, where the technology is such that there literally are, 
you, you can't really think of a limitation that you can't do in animation, you know? <laughs> I mean, now you can do photoreality that's indistinguishable. You can do, you know, effects. You can do, you know, procedural animation. You can do so many things. I mean, wh what can you imagine that you can't already do technically? So I think it's probably just gonna be people coming up with different stories to tell. I have a hard time um, actually thinking of, since I can't think of anything we can't do now, <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to imagine what would be coming along in five years that we couldn't do now if you thought it up. Well, and as, as films move into a hybrid, more of a hybrid approach, kind of blending technology and, and action and, and animation and movement and circumstance and settings and that sort of thing. Um, uh, how, how do we, uh, where do we do, draw the line? Where do we define an animated film versus a live action film? Well, the Academy has already done that, of course. And I was actually on the committee that wrote that rule because when we started that animated feature, you know, how many years ago now, like 18 years ago, we already knew that the day would come when you wouldn't be able to tell, you know, what was animation, what was live action. So we thought, well, you can't just say it's going to look like a cartoon. Animation to us has always been performance. It's always been creating characters that are imaginary characters. And so we've always said that it's the frame by frame performance by an animator that defines what an animated film is. So puppetry, which, which is real-time manipulation, and motion capture, which is simply transferring real-time motion, is not, by the Academy's definition, animation. The rest of the world doesn't care about that. You know, the rest of the world does not care. I mean, you can, and we've seen it, we've seen the Academy get fooled. We've seen student films in the Academy Award Finals that we find out afterward had no animation at all. They were 100% mocap. Wow. But because they were cartoony characters like robots or something, there was no way you could tell. I, do you remember? Le, do you remember Logo Rama? Mm. It was a film made about five years ago, a French film about logos. Oh. And the Michelin character in that film looked so rotoscoped. He was so, and it turned out he wasn't rotoscoped at all. He was actually keyframed animation. And so it's a funny thing, you know, you just can't tell. And so the Academy has tried to hang on to that, you know, definition to protect animation and animators. But as I said, there's no evil to technology. You know, if somebody can get a performance by using a technique and the audience just is captivated by the performance, you know, is there, is there a right and wrong way to do that? You know, I, I think that's the thing. And you're, you're going to see all these different, ways to animate you know to answer the previous question years ago we've always talked about scripted animation and and what we call procedural animation where <clears throat> you're able to actually write or code behavior and have an animated character behave no matter what they encounter you're already seeming seeing that in gaming in gaming you know in games you have characters that are already programmed to behave certain ways usually those are scripted to be more like almost like story points rather than actual motion itself. But it's only a small step to somebody getting so sophisticated that they're able to create a rig, that's a programmable rig, so that rig will literally, if it's tired, the character will walk in a certain way. If they're peppy, it'll bounce in a certain way. You know, If they're surprised, they will react in a certain way without an animator actually going in and literally keyframing the motion because they will have been scripted to behave a certain way. And that's that will come for sure, you know, it's, it's going to come down the line. So is that good or bad? Is that right or wrong? Is that evil or not? No, it's just technique, you know, it's just all achieving the same thing. And that is, you know, what do we call it? The illusion of life. What Frank and Ali said, it's the illusion of life. Are you entertained? Do you believe in the character and do you care about what they're doing? If those two standards are met, does anybody really care you know, how you did it. Well, and hopefully ideally seamlessly, so you're not paying attention to the technology that got you there, so that that is invisible, that it's an invisible part of the process, as you suggested, where uh, it's getting harder and harder sometimes to discern how was that achieved? Was it done through mocap 
or through rotoscope or through actual hand rendered artistry or pre programmed <laughs> artistry. So, uh, with this world of uh, technology and animation and, and visual effects blending more and more. Um, you, you've you noticed, what are you seeing in your students coming in to study this? Um, are, are they wanting to focus on particular disciplines? Are they wanting to blend those worlds? Are they eager to learn? Well, ironically, you know, one well, thing that's happened is the, anim the animation technology love is flipped, you know. When I started at Chapman 10 years ago, the vast majority of students were interested in CG animation, 3D Pixar style characters. Now that is completely reversed and the majority are interested in 2D hand-drawn television type characters. Yeah. I think part of that may be because the television industry offers so many jobs. I mean, it's just exploded. I mean, the industry is just exploding. But there's also a lot of more, more of a personal feeling to drawing a character, you know. I mean, it just gives you an ability to, and, and we, which we've always loved. Every frame can be a unique frame. Every frame can be a personal frame. So I think that might be part of the appeal to it. And it's, you know, in some ways it's technologically way easier to do. You know, it's so much easier to draw character poses and everything and everything. So it, it opens it up to a lot more people with a lot less, you don't have to be as, you know, intensely trained for it and everything. Well, and I, hopefully that'll instill a, a stronger sense of these principles that you've talked about, that um, getting to the core essence of what Frank and Ollie and others and Eric Larson were instilling in you as a storyteller, uh, and the technology can come later, hopefully. <laughs> um, Matt, what do we have for questions? Yeah, we have a question from Chrissy, who says, when you see students of yours working on the latest movies, Spider First, et cetera. How does that make you feel as a teacher and what do you hope that they bring to a project? Well, of course, nothing makes you feel more proud than to see your students be successful. You know, we've been very, very lucky to have so many of our students do so well. Uh, I, I have to tell you, one of my kind of proudest moments was visiting uh, one of the big effects companies in town where we had a bunch of graduates working and I, I met the owners and they sat me down they said, you know, we can always tell your students from any other students. <laughs> I said, really? I said, how's that? He says, when we give them a scene, they always ask us, what's the scene about? They never ask us the technical questions like, you know, well, what about shaders am I supposed to use? They always say, what's this, how does this fit into the story? That's the first thing they ask. And uh, I just thought, well, that's what we've trained about. You know, that's what it's all about. It's all about it really is all about story. Even if you're creating an explosion, <laughs> you know, what's the, what do you want? The, what's this explosion? How does this fit? Is this a scary explosion? Is this, you know, like supposed to be a surprise? Is this supposed to be kind of a comic thing? What's the feeling you want the audience to get? So I have to say that um, <clears throat> I've been real happy that our students have done well in the business. And I think a lot of the reason they do well is because, we, you know, they, they come out with, I think that, um, understanding the priorities you know we we drill in that idea don't get seduced by technology and never forget the underlying you know meaning of the scene and it pays off it makes a difference talk a little bit about it, not only in your teaching but um about building uh, teams putting together production teams um choices you're making if you're reviewing portfolios or uh and, and the long-term relationships that get established in this industry and how important that is. Well, we always tell students that those, those soft skills are probably maybe the most important skills for success. And we also point out that almost no school in America has a class called soft skills, you know. <laughs> and the irony is that's how you make it, you know. You, what's a soft skill? It's people like you. They trust you. You're easy to work with, you know. They want to work with you again. They want to recommend you to other people and say, hey, if we got to hire somebody, let's hire that person because they're, you're going to, you can rely on them. They work hard. They listen. They do what you want, you know, and they're talented, you know. So um, I think that's, uh, <clears throat> that's, a, that's something that should not be neglected is developing those soft skills and relationships. You know, Tom Cito always had a great line where he said to, he said to his students, you know, you know, husbands and wives come and go. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the people around you right now that you're working with that you're going to go be with you for the rest of your lives. You're all going to move through the industry together through the years. And so develop these relationships and this loyal friendships and loyalty. And, uh, you know, that will really, really serve you well. And, uh, and it, and it does, it has, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, and plus it makes it, um, so much more enjoyable to be in the business, you know, I mean, look, we're, how blessed are we to do a, to be making a living, making, not only making art, but working with people who are artists who have these skills and this sensitivity to the world, you know, to be expressive and to create beautiful things. I mean, it's, you can't, you shouldn't take that for granted. I mean, we're so lucky, you know, my dad worked his whole life in a factory. So did my grandfather, you know, I mean, the fact that I get every day to, you know, interact with people who are so talented and creating stuff that's so cool. It's just really, uh, I can't believe I get paid to do that. You know? <laughs> uh, when it comes to team building, do you, um, for example, on Fern Gully and in casting that film for your talent, your animation talent, um, did you have folks in mind straight away because of the, your shared experiences with them or uh, did you have to reach further beyond than the immediate pool of, of folks you knew to, to get certain aspects of that film? I just had to reach over about three feet to Sue Croyer, basically. Um, I mean, really, Sue did almost all the casting on the movie, you know. She, she's always been a connector, you know. She knows everybody in the business. She's incredible taste. She spots talent instantly. I mean, it's even today with her students. She'll look at a drawing on a desk and she'll say that student's going someplace and so you know really at friend gully you know at Cryer films you know sue was the one who reached out and got ralph in got tony and got all these people in and you know and would cast them and everything and you know she's that was the the the, the value of that partnership she was so terrific at that and what were her secrets well it was those there were just those two things i guess it's just being being friendly and open you know and and always enjoying you know, getting to know people. And then, look, there's the other thing about the business, and you can't deny it, is talent is important. Yeah. You know, you can be dedicated, you can be hardworking, you can be very intelligent, but the final ingredient is talent, you know, and that's something you can develop, but to some degree, you have to have it. You have to be kind of born with it. And people have different talents, you know. I mean, Sue's talent was not only just uh having great taste for art, but kind of a talent for kind of recognizing that in people, you know, better than me. I mean, I, I, she was way better than me at that. So, uh, you know, that's the one thing I tell my students as well, you know, you're so blessed if you have some talent. And if you, and you know this better than anybody, Mindy, the weird thing is when you, when you interview the people that we know that had the most talent, like Glenn Keane, you know, they worked harder than anybody else. Mm -hmm. and still continue to work. And this, that was the weird thing, is they worked harder. They could have coasted on that talent and been at the top. And yet, you know, Mike Gabriel and all these guys, the most talented people in the business, never stopped striving to be better. And I always, that's why I love to have the students meet those people and just hopefully be amazed at their attitudes, you know, is that, you know, they, they never said, I'm great. I'm happy with where I am. I can do what I, I'm, I'm good. You know, they never had that attitude. It's always like, you know, I, I'm really trying to get this better. I'm really trying to learn this one. I, I saw this the other night and I thought, how does somebody do that? You know, and that's, uh, that's one of those traits, you know, it's a talent. You take talent and put hard work with it and bingo. Yeah. That's a hundred percent success. And I think, absolutely. And I think it's, in, it's important for young artists to know today too, that it is an ongoing struggle and that you are always as an artist continuing to sharpen your skills and to um, strive forward. Um, but there are times that there is a struggle to it as well. And, and so, you know, there's no, yeah, the Glenn Keens of the world are sort of on another level, but it's nice to know he still has his moments that are make him human. <laughs> well, you know, I'm reading, ironically, I'm reading this book now by a, this journalist, the New Yorker writer, and it's all about her learning to play poker. Ah. And, and two of the main messages that she found in that game were number one, you know, uh, luck has a lot to do with life. But the other one was, 
you learn far more from failure than you do from success. You know, you get deluded. You can be easily deluded by success and think and get overconfident and think you've got it made. This is the one time you're forced to deal with your, a bit, your need to grow is when you fail. You know, when you try something and you screw up and it doesn't look good or it doesn't work or something, it forces you to say, well, how can I get better at this? You know, what did I do? What can I learn from this? And that's the reason you're, you constantly encourage people to stretch you know, and to try things. And if they get in, and if they show you something and you criticize it and it has problems, they should be happy about that. <laughs> you know, wow, you know, you're right. This could be better. This could have been better. I didn't understand that principle or this, I could have done this. And, um, you know, that's why I, I try to encourage students, don't shy away from critiques, you know, don't shut yourself off. I mean, the better students seek out critiques. You know, when we were young, like I said, we would, oh God, if you could have Ken Anderson look at a drawing and look at it and go over it, you know, you would give anything for that, you know? And uh, the more he ripped it, the more you felt, wow, okay. I got a lot of room to grow here, you know? <laughs> so. Well, and I, I, that's an important thing, at, you know, it, it, when I was in film school, it was learned to fall out of love with your footage and uh, talking with Tom and others uh, where they had professors who would literally you know, run their fingers across fresh paintings and smart things and, or draw over uh, what you thought was, you know, you were coming in with your strongest work and then you, re you see, wow, you know, being okay with killing your babies and, and stepping, you know, not being so attached to your work that you're going to have a million other drawings out there that you need to be doing. I'm not sure, you know, putting your cigarette out on student drawings is probably the way to go, but, uh, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the point of it, you know. The right. point of it is being open to learning more, you know. Exactly. And it is, you know, it's not even, agree, you don't necessarily even have to agree with the criticism. True. You, know, you may get a criticism from somebody else, and you should listen to that. Yeah. You should listen to it. And sometimes, you know, look, at nobody knows everything, you know. And it's an art, you know. You may be doing something that, according to quote classical principles is not really right but who knows you know at least you should hear about that principle and then make a decision and say you know i want to violate that principle i'm actually going for something a little bit different and i think it's going to work but and there's nothing wrong with that so let's bring this back to the idea of the principles of, of what you you teach uh and then supplementing with technology list some of the the core things that you impart to your students about the, the principles of animation before you bring technology and other tools to, to enhance that? Well, I think the primary thing is what I call, you know, the first noble truth. And that is simply to ask the question, who is this character and what are they thinking and feeling right now? You know, that's the first thing to ask as an animator doing an animated scene. Do you understand who this character is? and why they would do this, you know, you sincerely, care. sincerely, to make us really believe that it's not you as a puppeteer, but it's that character as a living thing that would make the decision and act this way, you know, that's it. That's the very, that's the thing. And you'd be shocked at how many live action filmmakers cannot even answer that question. Wow. You know, you stop the film and you go, okay, what's your character? What are they thinking right here? What, and, well, I want the audience to decide that. No, that's not the way it goes. You know, so that's, that's the thing, is that if you're gonna be an animator, an animator means to give life to, right? That's the name of the definition of the term. To be a real animator where you're making a character believable and appealing, first thing you gotta, you gotta know is who are they? You know, are they just a simple idiot? Is just a dumb rabbit? Or is it a rabbit that's sophisticated, you know? And is it a rabbit that's sophisticated that's also vengeful? <laughs> you know? I mean, you can't, <clears throat> you can't know too much about a character. You can't know too much. So anyway, that's, that's step one, you know? And then of course, step two is, once you know that, how am I gonna get the audience to sense that? You know, what tools am I gonna use? Because it's, I may have it up here, you know, and I may know the character has it, but how am I gonna get the audience to get it, and that's where a lot of craft comes in, you know? That's where you spend years understanding how to get it across, and 
it's you never stop studying that you know you never stop studying that when you i think it's amazing to watch great animated scenes and uh and the, when you watch them the first time, you've got a super clear shot to the heart understanding of what the character is feeling. And then when you go back and you analyze that scene, you go, wow, this isn't really that complicated. How did, why did I feel that? You know, that's part of the unending study of the animator, you know, is what's the craft. You know, when you talk to, getting back to our hand-drawn animation, talk to many of the inkers, uh, they always felt and, and that it, after 10, 15, 20 years of doing that aspect of hand rendered animation, they were just finally getting to understand and getting good at what they were doing after years and years of work. Uh, how has time, uh, what has time taught you in the craft of animation? Um, well, you know, Frank always used to, Frank Thomas used to always say that the young animator wants to put everything into the scene, the kitchen sink, whereas the experienced animator only wants to put in what's necessary. And I've never forgotten that. And luckily, as you get older and lazier and more tired, <laughs> that, that fits, you know, you, you just want to make sure, okay, what is the scene really about? What does it really need? You know, and am I getting that through? And I, that's, again, that's the simple question to ask. And, uh, you know, how can I, how can I really make that work? That's, that's kind of what, how the older animator thinks, I think. Yeah. Time teaches you though. You don't need all that fluff and frill. <laughs> get it, get to the essence of it. Probably. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you do, you know, the one thing that's kind of like, uh, in the balance here is the whole art form of 2d, which seems to be making a comeback. Well, it's definitely making a comeback in television, but, the art of full animation in 2D, you know, is, is, is that still kind of on the cusp. You've got only a few movies like, you know, Mary Poppins 2 and Claws, you know, where the animators are really allowed to do full animation, like really full animation. Because most, most 2D is television, which is not full animation, it's posed, you know. Yeah. And, you know, the, the whole art of the fully animated performance hasn't really been explored that much, if you think about it, over the decades. If you think about the different ways that has been done, you know, there are very few people like Dick Williams, you know, who came up with a style that you watch and you recognize that's different from anything I've seen, and yet it's very effective. So my hope is that students will continue to love 2D and to keep exploring that fuller, you know, expression of it, you know, to try to do, you know, more full performances with it. You know, I mean, as much as you love, you know, uh, anime, you know, all the Miyazaki films, they're not animated, really, you know, they're all posed. And, um, you know, they're terrific for staging and everything. But, uh, you know, we, 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 it was one thing I loved about Claws. I really liked, it was fun to see full animation again. I mean, really. And yeah. I think to that, we also need studios to get excited about that uh, approach to animation. And uh, we're seeing a lot of studios that are uh, animator run, animator owned, animator driven, animation driven. Um, so hopefully there will be a, a return to that where uh, we can get some filmmakers out there, as you say, really fully exploring the, the possibilities. I know even Walt in his day was always limited by technology and not able to really fully realize what he wanted in terms of animation. And, uh, even, Granted, the technology was a little more archaic than what we have today, but um, it's interesting how how you bring up a really great point where we just haven't fully seen where animation can go. And I think uh, given the right focus and direction and training from uh, artists such as yourself and your wife and, and many others from your generation, we may see that happen in the coming years. Matt, how the whole stu the, stu the studio and a laptop has really assisted that, you know, and in our day, you know, like you needed an entire crew to ink and paint and shoot and everything. Now you can do everything alone on your laptop. You can make the entire movie. So technology has been unbelievably, you know, um, beneficial to that effort. So if you really want to animate, you know, luckily the computer is going to carry a lot of that other stuff for you. And, and if you can't, and animation doesn't have to be all features, you know, you can make little short films, you can make two, three minute shorts and 
they're a great medium to try things, you know, and, and you, you, you and I both know that some of the things people remember the most of animation are short films, you know, they remember, I remember that film a few years ago, that little dodo bird that was put in the trees, you know, nailing the trees into the side of the mountain. It was so simple. And yet everybody talked about that film, you know, because it was just such a charming idea. So uh, anyway, it's a great thing about animation is that uh, unlike a lot of films, one person can still make a movie. And that's pretty amazing. A movie that will change the world and change people's hearts. Yeah, that's exciting. And very, as you said, it's all right within our fingertips. Uh, Matt, what do we have for additional questions? Yeah, we have a question in the chat from Colton, who first of all says that they're glad they're tuned in. They love all the stories in the early days of your career. Uh, but they wanted to ask, what kind of genres in animation and film do you think are lacking these days? He says, there seems to be a lot of the same kinds of stories and trends being done, uh, something that they're experiencing firsthand on the movies they work on but they would love to hear what kind of stories or genres you miss that should be revisited again or genres that should get more attention. Wow, that's an interesting question, you know. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, like a film that I always think of like that was um, Persepolis, you know, because it wasn't a comedy, it wasn't a musical, it was a serious movie. I don't know if you've seen that, but you know, I was so I'm, I'm impressed by that movie because animation has been, you know, a few things. It's always been fantasies. It's been talking animals. It's been musicals, you know, it's been fairy tales and stuff. And I guess the adventure comedy musical is the dominant saleable kind of movie. But when I watched that movie, a movie like Persepolis, it was more of a drama. And, you know, even a movie like Your Name, you know, uh, that de delves into little more deeper, mysterious psychological topics. I think animations really can do that. It can do anything, really. It's a matter if you want to find a different way, you know, to express it. Guys, yeah, I, I always love that expression from Brad Bird, where he said that his greatest desire in animation was to do a domestic argument. <laughs> you know, no one had ever done it, and then he got a chance to do it in The Incredibles, where he had you know Bob and Helen arguing <laughs> in the kitchen, and uh, that's so great because if you watch that scene, you've seen hundreds of scenes of men and husband and wives arguing, but you never saw it done in animation and it exploited animation. So I don't know, I guess just anything moving away from the, uh, what, what you consider to be the normal use would be fun to see. An opportunity to continually surprise, I think. Um, you've seen so many films uh, serving on the board uh, with the Academy and, and as part of the shorts and features and visual effects. Um, what kinds of things <coughs> or help keep you keep animation fresh for you and what you're seeing? Well, that's a good one. I mean, uh, I guess I still love to see great 2D. Uh, I love different design, you know. It usually for me, you know, even though we we're talking about animator performance, you always have to kind of go back to story. It's really the story concepts, you know, that people are trying to get across that, that, that usually, yeah, that's the kind of the foundation everything has to be built on, you know. I mean, you can see really great crafted 2D animation, but if the story is not there underneath it, it's going to fall apart. So, you know, I, I guess when I watch, you know, uh, when I go, like I just, I just just watched 85 select films, you know, the, you know, select has that thing. I just watched 85 animated short films when I was on the jury. And I, and I have to admit, the, the first thing I'm looking for is, what is there an idea here, you know? Is there, and I don't really, I, secondarily would be, it's only until I latch onto the idea do I start to sort of mentally, in the back of my mind, think, is this art direction right for this? Is this pulling me in? Is the mood correct, you know? And it actually works down to where, like, really only the third or fourth thing is, I, am I watching how high quality the actual animated motion is, you know? The first thing I'm always asking is, what, do I understand this idea, you know? What is the person, what is the filmmaker trying to say? Is there something about this character, or this situation that's compelling me to watch it and is pulling me in? And then if it is, then I start looking at all the elements they're using to do that and if they, they seem to be doing it well, you know? And that's the best way to do it. And that's how we ask our students to develop their thesis films. You know, the first thing we always say is, you know, do you have a central idea here? You know, 
what is your central idea? What's going to make the audience want to watch this? And then once you have that, everything else to, everything else is built on that. All your questions, you know, have to serve that. You know, every single thing, like the color, you know, the design, you know, the characters, everything has to serve that central thing is the audience understanding what you're trying to say to them. And if it isn't, if one element of that, one aspect of it isn't holding up to the same level as others, it's apparent, right? You're, you, it's about keeping everything operating on even heightened cylinders, I would imagine. Yeah, well, that's, that's, the, the best films do that, you know, the best films operate on all, like you say, all cylinders. It's, uh, you know, you, uh, sometimes you don't have all the tools you need, you know, then you have to make choices, I guess, and pick up, you know, just put it where you have to put it. <laughs> but, uh, is it getting out there these days? Because you do serve on a lot of juries and you're seeing a lot of content and material. Um, it's got to be getting very, very competitive. But is there any, we tend to see regions sort of exploding where suddenly a lot of talent is coming out of Ireland these days or out of South America or um, because it is such a global medium. Uh, what kinds of things are you noticing today? What trends, if there are any, in uh, what's happening on the animation scene? Well, you know, you do have those European schools doing super sophisticated imagery, you know, especially Film Academy in Germany and everything. Everything they do is so super sophisticated, you know, it's really quite remarkable. And then the French schools, all this stuff always looks great. You know, it just looks really terrific. So, you know, immediately you're, you have a, an, you're impressed by the fact that it looks great, but it all get it still gets down, back down to that simple thing about story. You know, do you really, is there a story here that really makes sense that you really connected with? And, you know, who's telling the best stories? I don't know. That's a, good, it's a very good question. Uh, I've been, really been surprised by some films from the Middle East, weirdly enough. I've seen some films uh, that, uh, you know, the students, I don't know what it is, but it, maybe it's the sincerity of the, of the stories they're telling from personal experience, but they really seem to have a lot of power, you know? And uh, there's, that's always a benefit, you know? There's that thing about, you know, write what you know, which I, of course, don't <clears throat> necessarily think anybody should slave to. <clears throat> but you do have that advantage that is if you have a, a story that you really feel, you know, yeah. like a good source for you to tell a story. Yeah. Matt, what do we have for questions? So we have a question from Matt who's asking, what advice do you have for aspiring artists who want to break into the animation or illustration industry? Is there something you wish someone had told you when you were entering the field? Well, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things is, uh, understanding what you're applying for, you know? I mean, if you personally have one area that you're devoted to, to pursuing, then you want your reel to represent your very best work in that thing, and that be, you don't wanna be a tie salesman and have 50 different things, you know? Because as you know, people in the industry just don't have time to watch your stuff for a long time. It's, it's kind of a, that, you know, we know this, it's a dirty secret that, they'll watch a reel for eight seconds, eight to 10 seconds before they shut it off. A lot of companies, cause they're just too overwhelmed. And so if you know what you really want to do, or the flip side is if there's a specific job you want, it may not be your dream job, but it's the one you want to get. Make sure that your reel has the very best work related to that skill set first and only put good work on there. I mean, that's, that's the first rule, rule number one, because again, you will, People may say they read your cover letter. Hardly anybody reads cover letters. They may look at your resume. Eh, maybe if it gets down to between you and three other people, they may do that. It's all about, it's an imagery business. You know, it's all about imagery. It's all about what, what, what's on the reel. How does it look? So that's really the thing I would say. Unless you're a production person, then that's a whole different story. But if you want to be an artist doing anything, whether it's development art, whether it's like prop design, whether it's character animation, even in between, anything at all, you know, shader writing, you know, make sure that you understand the job you're applying for and what skill set they would value most. Find your very best work, put that up first. And uh, that's the most important thing. Great. <clears throat> Other questions, Matt? Yeah, with all the working from home, do you think you could talk a little bit about how you see this impacting the workflow of animation in the future? You know, that's, uh, that's uh, such a timely question because we're talking about that every day. 
you know, I've talked to my friends at some of the biggest companies in the world, the, the premier companies, and they are all kind of amazed at how smoothly it's gone transitioning to home work, working at home, you know, where entire staffs relocated in a matter of a day or two. And in some cases, they're working on their home machines. In some cases, they were allowed to bring their work machines home. But in most cases, they're simply doing remote access to the machines still at the studio. And they're basically clicking along as if nothing had happened. And um, you're hearing a lot of reevaluation about whether the big office and the big studio should even be used anymore. Why, why do it? You know, we've always had that feeling that having that personal interaction with people on a personal level is kind of essential for the artist. Maybe not. You know, I think there are certain areas where it is like, if not essential, really valuable. The first being story. You know, there's something about sitting on a table with people and popping ideas and showing little sketches to each other. There's an energy to that and a synergy that I think might be more difficult to reproduce in a Zoom meeting. But once you get past story and you're getting into reviewing work done digitally, reviewed digitally, how much difference is there really? You know, and what they're they're finding, they seem to be finding now overwhelmingly is that it's not only is there no detriment, but there seem to be a lot of positives because the workers don't have to commute, you know? They're fresh. They don't have to even get dressed up if they don't want. They can come when they want, they can sit down, they can do their work, they can go back and visit their families. I think you're gonna see a real big change after this. I think you really are. And uh, we had all these, look, my generation had all that preconception about the fact that you need to be together physically. I'm not so sure the younger generation has that feeling. I mean, the younger generation has spent their entire lives online communicating with social media and everything. They're, they're so used to that. That's so normal for them, you know? It doesn't feel like a secondary thing. That kind of communication feels like a primary thing. And so, you know, I think you, this may be a sea change in how productions are done. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, any other questions, Matt? Yeah, uh, what kind of opportunities are there for filmmakers at Chapman University? Well, filmmakers at Chapman, uh, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, we, we, we actually have <laughs> a company called Chapman Film Entertainment that the previous dean started to make movies. So that company, because the new dean, we have a new dean now, Stephen Galloway. I'm not sure he's gonna go on with that, but it, but when that company was going, we were accepting scripts from anybody, you know, and with the potential of being produced. But other than that, you know, the filmmaking opportunities are for the film students. And we're constantly striving to provide the very best environment for that to happen. You know, right now we're, really looking into the whole area of virtual production, you know, to make sure that our students experience, you know, the kind of virtual production that's becoming so predominant in the industry. We're always trying to stay ahead of the curve on that. So, um, and that's a big challenge with, with, the, with the, the pandemic because that kind of stuff requires a certain amount of personal interaction. And um, that's the challenge to see. And it, you know, look, it, I, I'm not sure, we're gonna be like the rest of Hollywood, basically. We're not gonna be cooking again in, in a full tilt production mode until we get a vaccine, I don't think. I just don't think it's, I don't think we're that different from Hollywood. In a perfect world though, if uh, once we're on the other side of this, you guys really are doing some stellar work down at Chapman. It's an impressive facility and incredible talent there. Uh, it, uh, within the administration and faculty and certainly to the students. So it's, it's a school definitely that's uh, there to, to be a, a force to be reckoned with. So in a strong presence. So definitely keep an eye on, on where Chapman is headed once we get on the other side of all of this. Everybody's in a holding pattern. Yeah, well, we have a new Dean, you know, Stephen Galloway and he's, uh, he's very, he's very, innovative and he's, you know, he's completely in touch with uh, the technological revolution, which we, you know, we, we feel we've always, we've been able to keep up with that pretty well at our school. You know, I think we, our technology is second to none. And um, again, that's, you're always, you're always having to guard against that seduction of technology because people think, wow, we have all these new cameras. We have all these new things. All I have to do is point them at something. <laughs> <laughs> Not more than that. <laughs> Much more than that. I, I want to ask a little bit about, let's talk about your 
uh, lovely wife, Sue, you guys have had such a great partnership and wonderful presence all throughout you know, for decades in the industry. And you, you spoke a wee bit earlier about how, um, certainly on Fern Gully, the strengths that she brought to it. What, what do you guys do to um, keep your collaborative efforts fresh? Um, you know, I think part of it is the complementary nature of our talents, you know. I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely more of the director out front kind of guy, you know, and everything. And Sue is, she really does not like to be out front. You know, it's very hard to get her to do an interview or anything and do that stuff. She really prefers to be the behind the scenes person. But ironically, she's far more the connector. And, you know, it's, I've always been amazed at how, you know, Sue can get somebody's life story out of them in like five minutes. You know, like, you found out what? You know, I can't believe that she does that. And so it's that ability to kind of get a more deep, understand somebody more deeply and appreciate what they can do as an artist that just happens to be her thing. I, I think it helps to be complimentary like that. I think if we were identical in our interests and our skills and our strengths, it would be, you might bump into each other, you might argue more and everything, but we hardly ever do because I recognize where she has those abilities and I, and I really follow them, you know. She's the one that got me into teaching, of course. She taught for years before I did. You know, she was teaching at CalArts in Loyola. And she said, you really should try this. And so when Chapman called, I immediately said, I'm not a teacher. And I hung up. And she said, what happened today? I said, eh, Chapman University called me. And she says, you're going to go down there. <laughs> and so I went down there. And uh, when I met the dean, Bob Bassett, and everything, I, uh, it's just, this is a good school. I like this school. And so I have, I have her to thank for that. You know, she got me into this you got dynamic duo you really are it's it's uh, and that's a real treasure in this industry and the work that you guys have done behind the scenes that so many aren't even aware of just in fostering new talent and and training and educating uh, but the work at the academy and and in your own productive work it's remarkable and I that's why it's such a delight to be able to cast a light on that for a little bit um, so thank you for that. Uh, Matt, do we have any other questions to, to finish out with? Yeah, we have one final question here from Brian, who was asking, what do you feel about the initiative to remake animated content into live action? Do you feel that this is a self-defeating process that bumps against the notion that animation is a specific medium for depicting stories in a way that cannot be achieved through live action? A great question. And there's no simple answer to it. It's like most things in life, it's a nuanced answer. You know, I think that uh, it's typical of Hollywood to just want to do remakes because they feel, you know, reluctant. They feel, well, if it was a hit once, then I I'm safe green lighting it because I have evidence that it already worked. You know, that's like at your typical knee jerk Hollywood approach to doing remakes. Occasionally somebody has a fresh idea and, and does it better. I mean, I, I think, the John Favreau's Jungle Book was really great. And I think it was so different from the Disney Jungle Book, um, all the previous Jungle Books, that it was unrecognizable. And so what a, I'm, we're, I'm so happy he did that story over again because it's, I think it's by far the best. A lot of the other, some of the other live action remakes of animated films, I have not found to be trying something. They didn't seem like they had like a fresh approach or a really legitimate reason to do something different and new. They were just kind of exploiting the fact that something good had been done before and they're going to do it a little bit differently. So I don't think that's as, le that's as legitimate. I really have to say it's almost on a case by case basis. You know, if you, if you have a project that you feel can be told in a different way, legitimately, then why not? You know, if all you're going to do though, is just kind of follow the same, you know, blueprint pretty much in a different medium, it doesn't seem to be you know, that exciting. Well, it certainly has brought us to a blend of, of artistry and technology um, and advancing our capabilities. But to bring it back to, to your primary point about maybe some might feel lacking in, in uh, originality or a sense of what is the character and, and some of those basic principles that uh, in storytelling, um, finding an original take on that. Um, well, Bill, I can't thank you enough. This has just been a delight, a joy. It's, you're, we've just scratched the surface on your incredible career 
and the 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 progress that you've taken us through from uh, the very very beginning of technology. I know we will definitely want to get you back because we're looking at uh, perhaps doing a panel event around Fern Gully and and some of our we'll do more with technology as well. So. I just want to thank you again for your time, your experience and your expertise and your insights and sharing that with us. Um, look for this in a, a week or two. We're getting all of these pieces edited down and, and they'll be available on the CTN website. Uh, and keep an eye out. We've got some terrific events coming up with Lorna Cook, uh, Bonnie Arnold and others. So stay tuned for that and continue to check back at ctntickets.com. Uh, we are going to continue the chat. If you'd like, that'll continue off to the side and there'll be links in the chat area. So keep the great conversation going. Thank you for joining us here with Primary Sources and Bill, thank you for your work and for being one of our greatest primary sources in animation. Thank you, Mindy. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me.